Okay, our lesson this morning is entitled Praying, and this is the last lesson in this quarter. So what we want to do, make sure you get a new quarter, it's going to start next Sunday, and you'll be good to go. There might be a pop quiz, so study it. All right, so it's taken from Acts chapter 12, verses 6 through 18. So if you'll allow me, I'll read about it. And starting off, Peter's in jail again. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out, and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath set the angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. All right, so basically... (coughs) Peter's in jail, and he's awaiting execution because Herod had already executed James, the brother of John, and uh, he was seeing how his popularity was rising because of what he was doing to these new religious zealots that they were calling the way, and uh, he saw that it pleased him and increased his popularity so he said all right i'm gonna do it peter so he's got peter in prison and he's making sure that peter can't escape or somebody can't come and get him so you know this is uh what jesus said that followers of mine will suffer persecution and that goes throughout the whole bible there is going to be persecution if you're doing things for christ now Right now, it's not so bad for us. We might get teased, made fun of, or whatever, but it's going to intensify. So, you know, one of the good questions to ask yourself is, what would it take for me to turn my back on Jesus? Hopefully that answer is nothing. But as you start analyzing, it can get intense. So, hopefully Jesus comes back before it gets like that, but something to to be prepared for. Or compromise your morals or your beliefs, mm-hmm. you know, like the all the ones that are going to court. Yep. You know, because well, some people just get quiet. Livelihood. Right. Some people you just know? get quiet and don't say anything, and that's just as bad. So, but here's what it is. All right. So, and when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, so in other words, the night before Herod was going to determine what was going to happen to Peter. It says, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, 
and the keepers before the door kept the prison. He's secure so that nobody can come and get him. He's got two chains on him, chained to prison guards who are standing there, and then there's also guards outside of the gate to the prison watching. And he's anxious. I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> so Peter slipped between the two guards. Now, Peter probably knew that something bad is going to probably happen. And uh, he knew what happened to James. There's a lot of talk, a lot of things going on. But yet Peter is able to sleep because Peter's faith is in Jesus Christ. And it's like, come what may. I'm in God's will. If God wants to bring me home, that's cool. If God wants me to stay here, that's cool. Peter is just content. No matter what state I'm in, therewith I can be content. That's what Paul said. You know, he said, doesn't matter what's going on with me because my outward situations are not contingent upon my relationship with Christ, which gives me the peace that passes all understanding. So Peter is in that category. He's able to go to sleep the night before he's expected to be executed. And he's very secure between the guards so that he can't get out. Now, who was the ruler at this time? Herod. Which Herod? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good answer. It's Herod Agrippa. Now, Herod's grandfather was the Herod that tried to kill Jesus. Okay? Okay. Herod the Great, who tried to kill Jesus as an infant. Then later, Herod Agrippa's father was the one that had John the Baptist beheaded. And he also questioned Jesus on the night of his execution. And so this is the grandson of Herod the Great, Herod uh, Agrippa. And this guy is as corrupt as they come. I mean, he's just a, a piece of work. He's just very, very corrupt. And he's into popularity, ego, and all this stuff, and he's seen how by persecuting these Christians, it's garnering him favor and popularity with the people. So he's going to step it up. All right. So Peter wasn't worried about a thing. He was sleeping on the eve of probably his execution. And it says he had faith and trust in a sovereign <coughs> God. Now that brings up a question. Sovereignty versus love. Can the two go hand in hand? With Christ they can. With God they can. God still loves us, but he's sovereign. God gives us all kinds of ways of escape. He gives us all kinds of answers to our sin problem. The main one being Jesus. But do we quit sin when we accept Jesus? Unfortunately, no. So he put a passage in the Bible saying in First John, uh, First John 1 John 1.9, if you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Basically, that's written to Christians because he knew we were going to mess up. So God is sovereign, but yet he's a loving God. Okay, so the soldiers... Herod did not want Peter to be able to escape, nor did he want the possibility of somebody coming in to rescue Peter because he wanted to kill Peter. We're going to find out some more here later on that kind of gives us confirmation of that fact, but he wanted to kill Peter. So Peter is laying there asleep between the two guards. Now that's confidence, that's trust, that's faith, that's security in Christ. All right. Verse 7 says, And behold, and when you see the word and behold, something's getting ready to happen that we need to sit up and pay attention. The angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. All right, so the scenario is, this angel from God shows up in the prison where Peter's being held. And when he shows up, a bright light shines. 
Peter's sleeping pretty soundly because the light didn't wake him up. What woke Peter up? Smacking him. Could have been a smack. Could have been a poke. It could have been a jostle, whatever. But the angel said he smote him on the side. Come on, Peter. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Now, you're sound asleep, probably dreaming, and then all of a sudden somebody's waking you up. You look up. Wow, who are you? How'd you get in here? Where'd all this light come from? You're in a prison cell. They don't have lights to flick on and flick off. It's in the middle of the night, so it's dark. There's all this light in there. And it didn't wake up the guards? Well, if the guards were sleeping, they were derelict in their duty. Now, God can make things happen. They could have been sleeping. They could have been in a trance. They could have seen this angel and just absolutely freaked out and paralyzed them. We don't really know. It doesn't go into that. Probably didn't even see them. And they didn't even see their light. They didn't even react. So, Peter's reacting, but what is Peter thinking? He's thinking it's probably just another one of his visions. Yes, that's right, Dan. He's thinking, I'm either dreaming, it's a vision, this is not real. Now, when you're in a dream, some dreams are very vivid, some are very real, and you wake up from them and your heart's racing or whatever. Could have been a situation like that. But the angel told him, <clears throat> said, uh, came in and, you know, the, the, the chains fell off. Now, that was an indicator that something was going on when the chains fell off of Peter. But there again, he probably thought he was still dreaming. And in verse 8, the angel told him some directives. He said, I want you to gird yourself and bind on your sandals. Now, when you think about putting on shoes, is there a verse that comes to mind? in the preparation of sharing the gospel, putting on the whole armor of God, shod your feet. Okay. So the angel said, gird yourself and bind on your sandals. And so he did. And then he said unto him, cast thy garment about thee and follow me. Now he's given these directives to Peter, and Peter's obeying. But he's still kind of trying to figure out what in the world's going on. Verse 9 says, He went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he was seeing a vision. So this explains what's going on in his mind that there's something weird happening here. When they were past the first and the second ward, they come into the iron gate that leadeth into the city. Okay, cities had walls all around them. They had gates that they would lock at night for protection. Big old iron gate. So they came to the gate, and it said that when they saw that, uh, uh, when they came to the gate, that it opened of its own accord. There was no guard there to open it. It opened on its own. So it's like in the grocery store when you walk up and the sensor sees you and it opens. I didn't realize they had those back then. <laughs> Just kind of cool. But it just opened on its own. And they went out and passed on through one street. And what happened when they went through that one street? Somebody disappeared. The angel. The angel's job was finished. His task was to go and get Peter out of the prison, out of the city. His task was finished. Boom. He disappears. And the angel departed from him. When that happens, we're going to see in the next verse, what happens to Peter? He knows where he's at. He comes to himself. That's right, Susan. He comes to himself. Hey, this is reality. This is not a vision. This is really, really happening. Now, the thing about this angel, the angel was giving Peter instructions. And Peter was obedient. He was listening. You know, you don't question. You just do. Let God work it out. If we sit there and try to figure out things, we're going to say it ain't going to work. So God's powerful. If God is in it, just like Gamaliel said, if God is behind this movement, you can't stop it. If it's a man, it'll fail. 
So if God's doing this, it's going to happen. So the angel, which is from God, is directing Peter what to do. And God helps us maneuver through challenges and threats we face <coughs> through his commands in the Bible. So God helps us to navigate the waters. When we are trusting God, asking him to give us direction, and we feel like here's the direction, we trust him. He's going to navigate us through all the obstacles and, and make it work out. We have to trust him. And the angel probably went back to the Lord and said, job finished, what's the next project? That's exactly <laughs> right, Mike. Standing there ready to do whatever. All right, so verse 11. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know for sure, for certain of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod. He's delivered me out of the hand of Herod. He's got more work for me to do. They're not going to kill me. I've got more work to do. So he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt he was delivered out of the hand of Herod. And also he said, I'm delivered from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. Now, isn't that a sad indictment upon the Jews? The Jews had the Old Testament. They had the teachings. They knew there was a Messiah coming. They knew that God was at work and was going to, you know, do deliver them. But yet, they're blinded. And so well, they, they thought though it was going to be a messiah coming in on a white horse and going to kill all these a military messiah. Yeah, m military. Well, yes, but I think right here the power people they didn't want anybody messing up their game plan. They had it made. They were the in crowd, and they didn't want anybody messing with that. But the people that were, should have been taught by the religious leaders, but yet knew things, they wanted to see blood. They wanted to see these people destroyed. Sometimes people get a, a preconceived idea about something, just like Peter did in not eating unclean animals, which was a projection of not associating with unclean people. And God changed his mind all that. That's what we learned last week, you know, with uh, going to Cornelius and going in his house and fellowshipping. So here, Peter's learning all kinds of stuff. But he realized that the people wanted to see him executed. So God thwarted Herod's plans and he also thwarted the expectation of the Jews. And the same thing is happening today. Oh yeah, Amen. oh yeah. And the same thing happened to our pastor. Yeah, yes, exactly. We're ready for redemption. Mm -hmm. That's right. <coughs> you know, you, you go back into the Old Testament and you remember the God Molech? What was sacrificed to him? Babies. Babies. And that's still going on today. The blood is still being required by Satan. So, it's all the same thing. Um, and when he had considered the thing, what thing? <laughs> it was free. <laughs> what am I going to do now? They're going to be looking for me. So, when he considered the thing, he thought this through. He said, okay, I've got a plan. The first thing he did is he went to the house of Mary. How many Marys are there in the Bible? <laughs> it's hard to keep track of which Mary is what. Okay, this Mary is the mother of John, whose surname is Mark. Yes, who wrote the book of Mark. So that's where he's going. But there's also speculation that this Mary was the sister of Barnabas. That's what Matthew Henry was saying. He thought, he said, that's, some people think that. He didn't confirm it or deny it. He said, some people think that this Mary was the sister to Barnabas. They also think that this was the house that they used for the Last Supper. She hosted church in her house. So she was a devout woman that was very, very active in the early church. So Peter realized he needs to go there. And so he goes to the house, and there were many gathered there eating. No. Praying. Exactly. And there was many there praying. What were they praying for? for Peter. They were praying for Peter. Now, I'm getting ready to prove a point here to show you how we are as humans. 
So they organized a prayer vigil. And they've got a big crowd of people in this house, and they're all there praying for Peter. Now, can you maybe speculate on how maybe some of those prayers went? God protect Peter. God bless Peter. God be with Peter. Yeah, when things get hopeless and desperate, and you start praying and you think there's no way out, there is a way out. Right, Ed. But do you think they were praying, God, deliver Peter? I would think so. That's what they wanted. They wanted to be delivered. And they were desperate. They were desperate. How, How would God deliver Peter? They didn't know. But they're asking God to deliver him, protect him, take care of him, be with him. Matthew Henry writes, in Colossians it says, Aristarchus, whatever it is, my fellow prisoner greets you with Mark, a cousin of Barnabas. There you go. That would kind of confirm it, wouldn't it? Yeah. So. So what you're saying is we should pray for big prayers. Big prayers. Yeah. Exactly. Big prayers. But the point is, they're praying, okay? They're there praying. God, deliver Peter. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. Why did God mention that person in the Bible? That's a very good question, Susan. What did you say, Susan? Why did God give her name? Yeah, that's true. She came to the door. Now it said that uh, a damsel. So she could be a teenager. She could be a daughter of somebody there. She could have been a could have been who knows what. A servant. A servant, yeah. So she comes to the door, and when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness. Huh? She didn't let him in, let him in because she was glad. But ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. All right, so here's the scene. Everybody's in there praying. Man, there you know, I don't know if this is a 24-hour vigil and they have a sign-up sheet, you pray this hour, <laughs> this hour. But they're all in there praying. God deliver Peter. Knocking at the gate. And if you've got, way to think about this, you know, you've got a house and then you've got a wall, gate around it, and who's on the other side of that gate knocking? And they, this young girl goes out. Who is it? Let me in. She recognized his voice. But she don't let him in. She's so excited, she runs back in. That's why I think of maybe a little girl. She runs back in and said, Peter's at the gate. You're crazy. Let's see what they said. <laughs> they said unto her, Thou art mad. <laughs> crazy. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. So she said, Yes, it's Peter. Then, said they, it is his angel. Isn't that a weird thing to say? It's his angel. Now, as I was studying on this, they said that the Jews believed that everybody had a guardian angel. I didn't know that. That's what Matthew Henry said, that uh, the Jews believed they had a, they had a guardian angel. And this was the guardian angel coming for whatever reason. Then others thought, well, they killed him, and this is his spirit coming back. Now here's the the question. What were they doing? For Peter. Why didn't they believe it could be Peter? (laughs) Well, it was an impossible situation. Exactly. Because they looked at it from man's perspective. (coughs) Man, he can't get out of there. Well, then why pray about it? If that's the way you believe. But they were really fervent in their prayers, so they were believing God to do something. When God did it, they didn't believe it. But see, that's how we are, because we're finite. We're humans. What do we got getting ready to happen here at Peninsula Baptist? Peninsula Stepping back in time. What have we got getting ready to happen here at Trinity Baptist Church? A capital stewardship campaign. 
Now, what we're doing, we're seeking God's direction. Okay? We're asking God to show us what you want to do. That's a lot of money. Okay? If I was to write a check for that much money, I'd have to, you know, go without for a couple of years. Okay. That, that's a pile of money. And if you look at that dollar figure from man's perspective, oh, there ain't no way. There ain't no way. I just can't see. Economy's bad. We don't know what's going to happen in the election. We don't know what's going to happen with this, with that, or whatever. And that's all legitimate questions. But the next question would be, God, what do you want? And if God wants us to do it, God's going to provide a way for it to happen. Somebody that we don't even know could hear about it and say, eh, here's $10 million. It's just like here. They were praying for Peter to be delivered. God said, you got it. Delivered him. He comes to the prayer meeting. Ain't no way in the world that's Peter. He's in prison. But aren't you praying for him to be released? Yeah, but. That yabbit. That's a strange animal right there. The yabbit. <laughs> yeah, but. So. There's talking all kind of crazy stuff here. It's his angel and all this. You're mad. You're crazy. But Peter, praise God, was persistent and kept knocking. He just kept on knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But you know what? I bet they learned from this. Now, when Peter was in that prison, that angel came and get him out. He thought he was having a vision. Had Peter not been rescued from prison before? Yes. Why do we not keep all this stuff going? Do you know what spiritual markers are? Spiritual markers are things that happen in your life that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt it was God doing it. I reference it to when they were crossing over the Jordan River and they put in rocks as markers to remind them of what was going on. We have spiritual markers in our lives today. Things that God did for you in a very, very special way that you remember. And God wants you to remember that so you can look forward to stuff in the future. A lot of times when we get into a situation and we look at the reality and what's going on, we forget about stuff God did in the past. We focus on what's going on right now and it freaks us out. That's what's going on right here with them. They know what God can do. But yet the reality of the situation causes them to be weak. But you know, I always say the learning curve is very expensive. But once you learn it, you got it, it's yours. And we learn these things. So they're astonished. And they're all just babbling, talking, carrying on everything else. And Peter says, shh. Beckoning unto them with his hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the angel, or how the Lord, had brought him out of the prison. So he said, here's what happened, real quickly. He said, now, go and show these things unto James. I thought James was dead. Different James. Oh, kind of like Mary, a different James. Which James is this probably referring to? Jesus' brother. Half-brother. Half-brother. Jesus' half-brother. Okay? So go and show James I'm out. And also the brethren. And he departed. Who departed? Peter. Why? He can't stay there. They're going to be looking for him. So he departed and went into another place. It was secret, so they don't tell you where it is. Now, that's a beautiful story right there. Okay? But here's the other part that's kind of sad. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. In other words, there was a large stir among the soldiers because there was no evidence of anything amiss except Peter wasn't there. Now, as we read on, what happened to those soldiers? Oh, uh, they got executed. They got executed. According to Roman law, that if a soldier is in charge of protecting a prisoner and that prisoner escapes, that soldier suffers the fate that was supposed to be for the prisoner. 
So they were executed, which kind of confirms Herod was going to execute Peter. So they were executed. Yes? No, when you're done, I want to say something. Okay. So Peter was destined to be executed, I believe, in this situation, and God delivered him. Because God wasn't through with Peter. There's more for Peter to do. You're still alive today because there's more for you to do. Okay, God, what do you want? I'm yours. You bought me. I belong to you. What do you want? So, it's a beautiful lesson, but the biggest takeaway on this, they were praying fervently, and God answered, and they weren't expecting it. And also, when times get desperate, and you feel hopeless, God can take care of it. And Peter wasn't doing the praying. Right, right. Peter was sleeping. That's right. And it was intercessory prayer. So it just shows how important our prayers are in the work of the kingdom. Yes. And in God's plan. Very good point, Chris. Very, very good point. Don't you think Peter was praying when he fell asleep? Sure. Do you ever fall asleep praying? <laughs> Do you, and as you start going through that, you, your prayers get kind of jumbled up and weird like. Okay, just make sure I'm not the only one that does that. <laughs> All right, so Peter is free. The soldiers are in trouble. God's in control. All right, let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for another day you've given us. Lord, we thank you for this lesson. I pray that you will help us to realize who you are and what we have available to us through Jesus. Father, bring home truth to us that we need to develop into our walk and in our lifestyle. Help us to be more about you, Father. Help us to trust that when we pray that if it's your will, you're going to do it. And we thank you that we have that ability to pray to you at any time about anything. And right now, Lord, we just pray and ask that you would go with us into the next hour, that you would speak to us from the new sermon series that Pastor Mark is going to start this morning as we look towards this capital stewardship campaign. Lord, we're looking for your will, and we acquiesce to you and your plans. Give us your wisdom. Give us your direction. And we praise you for it all in Jesus' name, and amen. Amen.